the Lord had really put into my heart to deal with a couple different things tonight. And one area I wanted to um, really work with is the area of the occult. And uh, a lot of Christians, uh, you know, have have asked me. I've, in fact, Thursday night I have a big series going on the occult and and deliverance and things of that nature. And you know, a lot of it, it is kind of an area that a lot of churches don't get into. They just don't like to touch it for some reason, although it's part of the gospel. It's a very uh, powerful part of the gospel because the Lord, you know, commissioned us to go out and deliver the ones who are oppressed and were possessed, were sick, right? Of all nature of things. And a lot of times we go and uh, we pray for people and there are a lot of people that are what I call defeated Christians. And they're, you know, they're just kind of constantly um, beat down. And they never quite get the, the total victory. Now, I want to share with you one particular thing, and that is I've had people ask me, well, can a, can a Christian be demon-possessed? No, a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. He can be oppressed to such a point that you may think he's demon-possessed, but he cannot be demon-possessed. Where light dwells, darkness flees. It's just that simple. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be filled with an with a unholy spirit because where light is, darkness will flee. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're out here sowing some different kinds of things that you're not going to be afflicted by it. Because if you're out there, uh, you know, sowing seeds, then uh, you're going to get a harvest. There's a guaranteed a harvest for sowers. Guaranteed. And I've had some Christians that and done a lot of counseling and, and a lot of deliverance type ministry and things of that nature. And I had one girl who was a heroin addict for a long time. The Lord delivered her. She was just healed. It was a, it was a real miracle and it was fabulous. And um, she had a baby and her baby she gave to her mother-in-law and uh, her mother-in-law was raising the baby. <clears throat> and what ended up happening, as this girl grew in her faith and everything for a year, she felt she was strong, she was ready, she was living for the Lord. She went back and tried to get the baby from the mother-in-law. And the mother-in-law said, you cannot have the baby back ever. We have legally taken the baby. And she absolutely was devastated absolutely devastated and she told me she said i cannot understand how come god would do that to me why would god do that to me after i've repented after i've done all of those things i said you don't understand you do not understand what it means when you talk about sowing and reaping you don't understand you see when you were a rotten character you sowed, didn't you? You were sowing every kind of a rotten thing that you wanted to do. You were throwing it in there. You know, immorality, dope, you know, every kind of thing that goes along with it. And there's a lot of things that go along with it. Now, after you've done that, you accept Jesus, and then you turn around and you say, oh, harvest don't come up. Harvest is coming up. Period. I don't care what you say, harvest is coming up. Now, what you have to do is you have to start planting a new harvest. You have to start over planting, over planting, over planting, over planting, over planting. And eventually, people are not going to look at you as a weed. For instance, if you, if I take this fellow and I get in my car and we go out here and we get to this, to this, um, weed patch. And we get out of the car and I, and I look at this big thing and I say, what is that? As far as you can see, he's going to say weeds. So that's right, it's weeds. Now what if I go out there and cultivate that? 
and we really work it and we do everything and pretty soon you see this beautiful grains of wheat just blowing there and, and just as far as you can see. Now I get him in my car again, we go back down there. And now we get out and I say, okay, what is that? He's going to say that's wheat. He doesn't say it's weeds. He says it's wheat. I say, okay, now come on over here and let's look down this aisle. Do that to any one of those patches you want. And when you look down that aisle, you know what you're going to see? Weeds. Weeds. They've got to stay on top of it. Because weeds will start coming in. But he doesn't call it weeds anymore. What does he call it? Wheat. Because you overplant. Anybody who has an oppression must overplant. You must start planting and planting and planting and planting and planting good words, powerful words, powerful things in your life. That's what you must do. That If I give you a prescription, if you come to my office and you're having problems in your life, that's the prescription you're going to have. And I can give you lists of people that will testify that their deliverance came the first night that we prayed for them and they started on this this road, you see, but you can always open yourself up again, can't you? All you got to do is be neglectful with that field. You go out there and tell, talk to some farmer. You neglect that field, you get weeds. You neglect your backyard, you get weeds. I don't touch my grass, I get weeds every time. I mow it, I do what I'm supposed to do, and it looks nice. There still may be weeds, but it looks nice. The same thing in your life. That girl planted. She has a harvest. You planted when you were not a Christian. You have a harvest. You don't have to dwell on your harvest. It doesn't have to be the predominant part of your life. But you have a harvest. When a person is in a cult, they have a harvest. Their mind says, I wonder if that was right. I wonder if this was right. I wonder if that is a... You know, all these things come back in their mind, you see? They have to overplant the right things in their mind. And in their, that's why the scripture says what? Renew your what? You renew your mind. Why do you renew your mind? Because you got all that trash in it. You see? Satan affects your mind. He affects your mind. And because that's the only way he can get you. He gets you through your eyes. He can get you through your ears. He can get you through your senses. And, and he works on your mind. And as he works on your mind, it starts to develop in your character, and then it progresses. The Scripture calls it activating and become sin. As you, as you read, you'll see that's true. So, you know, you cannot stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from nesting in your hair. Right? And, and that, that's true. You, you can't stop from these things going on all around you because we're in the world, but we're not of the world. But the thing of it is, is we can, every one of us has a point of deliverance. Whether you know that or not, you do. It depends upon how much you've been planting in your new garden. If you haven't been doing your planting and you're wondering why your harvest isn't there, because your old harvest is overpowering your new one. You see, it's there. It's just like you take a dart. You have a dart board and you throw that dart like that and you pull the dart out. That's when Jesus forgave you. Is there a hole in the dart board? It's a hole in the dart board. I want to tell you something. Jesus will heal you. He'll forgive you. He'll cast it as far as the east is from the west. But you know who can't hardly do it sometimes? You. You're your worst enemy. You can't quite forgive yourself. It's true. And Satan throws that back <clears throat> every time. He'll throw it right back on you, right back on you, right back on you. The reason I'm bringing this up is because <clears throat> the cults have a way of... Uh, bringing a person's mind into captivity. And it is very, very hard for a person who's been involved in a cult. Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Moonies. I've had deprogrammed Moonies. 
Uh, you can call it deprogramming or reprogramming or whatever you want to call it. It is a long process. It's a long process. I've had the police department turn the people over to us. We've stayed right with them in the house for three days at a time and, and uh, prayed with them, talked with them. Uh, I've got there and the Moonies would get down the floor and start doing push-ups and say, Reverend Moon, Reverend Moon, Reverend Moon, Reverend Moon, you know, just over and over and over and over to kind of pump up their faith. You see, their, their minds have been affected. And any person who's been involved in a cult, I want to tell you something. Their mind has been affected. It takes replanting and a real powerful planting of the Holy Spirit in that person's life to overcome the old nasty harvest. You talk to any one of them. There's a girl that used to be a Jehovah Witness. She's here somewhere, right there. Is that true? That's true. Thank you, brother. Glory to Jesus. It's anointed. Living water. It's true. It's really true. Every person I've talked to. Now, one thing, when you're dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, you're not dealing necessarily with the occult. There is a difference between the occult and a cult. A cult is a basic uh, error in the Christian faith. That is really what a cult is. It is a group of people, whatever group, and they claim the backing of Christ and the Bible. And the whole idea is, is they have a different Jesus. That's the bottom line. If we want to do away with everything else, I can take you to churches in the United States tonight where uh, that sister right there, sitting right there, that pretty one right there with her elbow showing, would be unholy. It's true. Now, I go in that church and it bothers me because I think they're out in left field. And I think scripturally I can prove they're out in left field. There's no elbow that would ever get a man excited that I know of. There's no, 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 no luring in an elbow, you know, ah, you know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, um, it's true. And I've dealt with a lot of the pastors on that. But you see, it's a doctrinal point with them. It is a doctrinal point with them. Now, can we say, oh, that's a cult. Now, there are groups that say no lipstick, no jewelry, no glasses. Now, that lady right there with them nice, shiny, pretty glasses. Now, see, she'd, fall, she'd be really in deep trouble. Too shiny, see? Too much glisten and uh, that sort of thing like that. Now, does that make that group, it, you can call it an overkill if you want to, an overholiness kill. I believe that the scripture defines that the first you cleanse the inside of the cup and then the outside of the cup will reflect what has happened inside. Right? And uh, that, that's how it happens. You don't clean the outside and then hope the inside is going to make it. And you can just do whatever you want. You can tape your lipstick off and you can do whatever you want. You can still be a character. And that, that's the way it can be. Now, does that make that group of people a cult? No. And I will tell you why. It, I think it's a heavy bondage trip, a man-made bondage like a lot of different groups. But the bottom line is, do they have the same Jesus of the Bible? They do. They have the same Jesus. They believe that they believe in the Trinity. Now, there is a group that doesn't believe in the Trinity. I'm not talking about that group. I'm talking about the group that believes in the Trinity. They have a lot of other little things. And see, there are churches you can go to. Uh, uh, that brother right there with, a, with his fairly long hair, he'd be an outcast. See, he'd be an outcast. They'd think he was just a burnout or a hippie or something. You know, I don't know what they'd think. He was just not spiritual or something. That's the biggest lie in the world. Because God doesn't look at his hair, looks at his heart. I mean, that's one of the first lessons I learned. And the exciting thing, though, you see, does that make them a cult? No, it doesn't. Because they've got the right Jesus. 
Now, you can go into a lot of these different groups and you just find out if they have the right Jesus. Now, if they have the right Jesus and all the other stuff is weird, then if you want to submit to that, that's up to you. You can still get saved. There are groups that say, don't eat meat. The Bible says, you know, everything is good. If you want to eat it, eat it. It's not going to kill you. It may kill you. I don't know. It might take you this life, but it has nothing to do with your eternal life. Right? There are a lot of things that are not good for you. But we're talking about eternal things. Now, we go to the issue of Jehovah's Witnesses. Do they have the Jesus of the Bible? No. Their Jesus is Michael the Archangel. They say before Jesus came to earth, he was an angel, and his name was Michael. The Bible in John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? An angel? Was God. Was God. Capital G-O-D. God. So I'm going to have to believe the Bible. Now how about the Jesus of the Mormon church? That's what we're going to cover tonight. The Mormons have another Jesus. They have another gospel. They have a lot of different things that are out in the left field. And they are definitely a cult. And they are also involved in the occult, which is the mystery, the mysterious, the... Uh, the uh, delving into the um, things that really are occultic practices like speaking with the dead. How many know that Mormons actually have a ritual where they speak with the dead? They do. In their temple, they have that, where they speak with the dead. If you wanted to, uh, if you were in good standing, want to speak with your grandma or whoever, you go to the temple, they have the rites. And you know who they're speaking to? A familiar spirit. You see, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, not every little angel that appears is a good one. You know, just because an angel appears, people go, wow. Just like somebody said, I, you know, an angel appeared to Joseph Smith. I said, whoopee. How do you know it was a good one? That's the problem. You know, I had a Mormon ask me, he said, have you ever read the book of Mormon, Mr. Greasehaber? I said, no, I haven't. He said, and how can you be authority? I said, well, I don't have to read anything to necessarily be an authority. God has given me a brain. I haven't read the book of Satan, the Satanic Bible. By the way, it outsells the Christian Bible on most of our campuses in the United States today. And that's awful sad. The Satanic Bible is becoming a big seller. In our country. And uh, he said, well, uh, would you mind getting down on your knees and praying about it? I said, not necessarily. I don't think I need to pray about it. I mean, if God's given me a brain, why, wash, why waste my prayer time on that? He said, well, doesn't the Bible say pray about all things? I said, yeah, all things I don't know. You mean, why would I pray about something I know? Wouldn't that be dumb? Wouldn't that be dumb to get down and say, is the Satanic Bible good? God, tell me. God said, dummy, get up. <laughs> right? I mean, there would be no wisdom to that. But if I would, Mr. Mormon, if I would, let's just say I got down there and I got your Book of Mormon and I said, God, is Joseph Smith a true prophet? Is that what you'd want me to say? He said, yes, that, that would do it said, okay, well, let's say I did that. What would I get? He said, well, I said, would I get something like this? Yes, he is. Did you hear a little kind of echo like that? He said, well, I doubt it. Well, how, what would you get? He said, most of us get a burning in the bosom. I said, a burning in the bosom? I said, you know, the other night my wife and I were at the Pizza Hut. I had one of those pepperoni deals. I had that burning in the bosom. Now, I didn't ask one thing about Joseph Smith. Do you think that could have been something? I said, now, isn't that ridiculous? 
just because you get a burning in your bosom, a tickling in your ear, or a thump on your head, do you think that that's the Holy Spirit? I said, isn't that crazy? I said, if there was only one spirit in the world, just one, then you get down, get a burning and a buzzing and a thump or whatever you want, and you could jump up and say, that's it. But you see, we have other spirits. And the Bible says they'd love to give you a burning and a tickling and a twitching and the whole works. So you'd be out on your 10 speed someplace. Now, do you think that's what you should do? They said, no, I don't think that's what I should do. I said, well, that's the reason I don't do it. I said, first of all, you guys don't even have the name of your church right. That always gets them. See, because they say, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When you tell them they don't even have that right, that really gets them excited. They say, oh, yeah? I said, that's right. I said, let me just tell you what happened in the name of your church. According to Joseph Smith, the prophet, he was an instrument who God restored the church through. This is his statement. The precise day... And the precise name of the church was given to him through divine revelation. And here is the name of the church. Given by divine revelation is the church of Christ. Now, four years later, in 1834, the name of the church was changed. This is the name of the church now. The Church of the Latter-day Saints. Now, four years later, the name of the church has changed again, uh, April of 1838. This is the name of the church now. This time it became the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, doesn't it seem strange, Mr. Mormon, that God, through divine revelation, took eight years and three revelations to get the name right? He come down, he says, ha ha, I fooled you, I'll give it to you again later. Right? Did he do that? I mean, is he restoring this or what? And they'll say, well, we don't know anything about that. Well, you better check it. You see, part of Mormonism is educating them what Mormonism teaches. Because most of them don't even know what they teach. We had two Mormon missionaries came over to the house. They sat down, and one thing about Mormons is when you pray for them, they don't mind praying with you. In fact, they'll be real nice. They'll smile, you know, and and they just just look real neat. And I said, do you mind if I just pray before we start this? And they said, oh, no, that would be wonderful. You know, they just want to be so pleasant, so sweet and nice, you know, and just, just like honey, you know. And I just got up, and I laid hands on them. Now, see, they think that that's when they receive the Holy Spirit when you lay hands on them. So that really gets them, right? And I laid hands on them. I said, oh, God, just show them that Joseph Smith is a false prophet. Let them know that Jesus is the truth and the way. And he said, and I just gave him a whole neat sermon, you know. And it was fantastic. They started kind of shaking and got all antsy, you know, and quivering like and everything. And at the end, both of those boys accepted the Lord. It was really neat. My wife and I have seen lots of Mormons except Jesus. In fact, there is a group in California now. I don't know. You may have heard of it. It's called Ex-Mormons for Jesus. I don't know if you ever heard of that. But it's a group, and it started in our vice president's office or in his home with a couple people that accepted the Lord. In fact, there's a group out now. It's really kind of neat. Instead of Latter-day Saints, they changed it now. And the ones that are coming out, they call themselves present-day saints. Isn't that neat? So I, I think that's really great. and uh, But, you know, one of Satan's biggest things, and I think we have to really look at this, because in a lot of these groups, whether they're uh, Baha'i, I don't know if you ever heard of the Baha'i group and Bahu'u'llah, but they always come around when there is a big uh, group of people around. Like we had a couple big conferences, and they'll float around out in the foyer and things like that. And I was out there, I don't remember what conference we were at, but I was out there kind of floating around in the foyer a little bit. And it was unbelievable. I came, I was just standing there, minding my own business. And this fellow comes up to me and he said, what do you think about, about the Baha'i? 
I thought, "Uh uh-oh, I can't believe this. God is bringing these people right to me. I mean, I'm just taking a break. And I said, well, I said, I kind of think it's just like your leader, a lot of Bahula. (laughs) And boy, I mean, to tell you, him and a couple others just took off out of the building, you know. But you see, they're never confronted. They're just never confronted. And so we need to confront these people. It's just like the, the Moonies. In the back here, right after Revelation, the Moonies will put what they call divine principles. And the divine principles, they'll tell you, is just nothing more, uh, this is what they say, than additional revelation. And they, they'll say, well, we believe the Bible, but we think that this, this is uh, the latest revelation right here. Now, when you ask the Mormons, Do you believe the Bible? They'll say, of course, as far as it's translated correctly. See, they always throw that little (laughs) down the end there. And when you think about it, you think, oh, gee, maybe that it's just a word or something they're talking about. You see, they're not talking about a word. They're talking about whole paragraphs, whole sections. They're not just talking about a word. And, you know, it's kind of interesting that we allow... Satan to come to the Bible and say, well, we don't think the Bible's correct via Joseph Smith or Reverend Sun Yan Moon or whoever. We don't believe the Bible's correct. So then we start judging the Bible. But you know what the Bible says? It says, check the prophet, doesn't it? But you see, the prophet under the direction of Satan, has switched the whole thing, and now you've got all these Mormons checking the Bible, when actually the Bible is supposed to check them. You see how Satan can switch things? And he does it. So now when the Mormons talk to you, they'll say, well, we don't believe that section's translated correctly. We should be saying, hey, we don't believe you're translated correctly. You see? And we should challenge them with the standard of God's Word. Now, when they say that they don't believe the Bible is translated correctly and and, uh, things are changed and everything like that, well, let's check them out. Let's see if that's true. Uh, Let's just look at the Bible. Turn with me, if you will. I'm going to give you some scriptures here tonight. If you'll turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Hope you brought your Bibles. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture... Now, I think that would cover cover to cover that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Now, that's pretty powerful. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That teaches that these men did not write in their own private opinions. That what they put down here... They were moved, and you can see that right here in verse 21, that they were moved by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit actually moved through them. Now, let me give you another one here. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, Verse 16, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture, your Bible may say every Scripture, the same thing. All Scripture is inspired by God. Now, does that mean that this section right here we can take out? Not if I say all Scripture or every Scripture. We may not understand it. I mean, we may not understand every little thing, and and I'm sure we don't. But that doesn't mean that it's not inspired of God. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, 
for training in righteousness, now watch this, that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Isn't that interesting that that was written to the first century Christians? The first century Christians were equipped for every good work. If he was in the first century, he was equipped for every good work. Why in the world did we need Joseph Smith if he was equipped? If he's equipped for every good work, we don't need anybody else. Right? We don't need Bahu'u'llah or we don't need uh, all these other guys. We need Jesus. If he equips us, we're equipped. Now, let's go a little bit further. I want to give you some more. Isaiah 40, verse 8. Now, these two scriptures I'm giving you, you should write these down because these are powerful scriptures. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now, I don't care how much you want to try to destroy it. You can go home and rip every page out of your Bible and throw it in the trash. You haven't destroyed anything but your own Bible. God's Word will stand forever. Whether you like it, whether you don't like it, whether Mormons like it, doesn't make any difference. God said it'll stand forever. I'm not going to listen to Joseph Smith, what he says. I'm going to take God's Word and check him. God said it'll stand forever. Joseph Smith said, it won't. Let's go a little further. I want to give you one more scripture on that. In Matthew, chapter 24, verse 35. Matthew 24, verse Heaven and earth will pass away, watch this, but my word shall not pass away. Isn't that neat? Heaven and earth will pass, the flowers will fade, the grass will wither, but my word shall not be destroyed. In other words, God's saying nothing can destroy it. Nothing can destroy it. But yet Joseph Smith said somehow down the line, God's word was able, man was able to distort and destroy his word. Now, you have to remember one thing. We're not talking about translations. There are lots of translations. If you want a good book on translations, let me recommend it to you. It's a little, it's a little paperback book, about $1.95. It's called Many Translations. It gives one good thing about the translation, one bad thing. One good thing, one bad thing. One good thing, one bad thing. When it comes to the New World Translation, it only gives one bad thing. Because there is no good thing. It's true. It's what it does. That's the reason I like it. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a great book. There are a lot of translations. And translations are used for a lot of different things. And uh, they're marketed for a lot of different areas. But that has nothing to do with the main word of God. You see, if you really want to know exactly, go back to the Greek. Go word for word for word for word for word for word on the Greek. It's real boring reading, and I doubt if you'd read long like that. You'd go, ah, da, 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 and you'd go, oh, boy, this, I've had it. Give me the New American Standard or give me the King James or something. In a way, then you'd read and you'd enjoy but if you want to study, then you go back to the original. And that's what we're talking about. Now, the Mormons have what they call the great apostasy or the great falling away. And what they mean by that is that uh, there was no representation of any Christian on the earth. And therefore, they needed to restore the true church of Jesus Christ. And in order to restore this, they needed a leader. And this leader was a prophet, and his name was Joseph Smith, supposedly. And they call that the great apostasy. And they say there was a 
There was a big falling away. There was no nothing left of the church. And I agree with one thing. There is a falling away. There will be a falling away, even more so as we get towards the end. There'll be a great falling away. There'll be a big shaking going on, and people will fall, and they'll just, you know, they'll follow doctrines of demons. But the problem is, or the truth is, that there is always a representation of the true church on this earth. Always. There are people that will always fall away, but there are always true followers. Now, let me give you some scriptures that you can confront them with. It's in Matthew, and we'll stay in Matthew for a second. So go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. And let's look at verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now watch this. And the gates of hell shall not overpower it. In other words, even hell can't destroy it. It's going to be here. It'll always be here. See, God will always be. It'll always be with us. If anything leaves, it's us. We leave God. God doesn't leave you. In Matthew 28, verse 20. I love that song, He Was There All the Time. Because it really is. Matthew 28, verse 20. And there's a word in here you should underline in your Bible. Because on those stormy days, on those times when you are down, when Satan has you beat down to the ground with negative statements, negative thoughts, negative everything, and he has a good way of doing that. And when he has you down and you think everything is coming in on you, I want you to read this and remember just one word. And you know, God's word can get you excited when nobody else can. And here it is in verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you part of the way, and then Joseph Smith's got to come and take it the rest of the way? No. And lo, I am with you always. When you have hard times, when you have good times, doesn't make any difference. He is always there. Now, that word always does not have a break. You see that? There's not a break in there. The Mormons say, well, there was a falling away. We needed Joseph Smith to restore the church that there was no representation of the church on earth. That's not true because the Bible says, I'm with you always. Now, he may not have been with a whole lot, but he was with some always, and he will be in the end. Now, the interesting part here is there's one scripture, I believe, that just fits the Mormon church to absolutely to a T, and I don't know of any other group in the world that this scripture will fit. If you'll turn with me to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, First Timothy 1, and let's look at verse 3 and 4, verse 3 and 4. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at emphasis in order that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. There are a lot of weird doctrines going on, just like there are today. Nor to pay attention to myths. A myth is like a little fairy tale. Now watch this. Don't pay attention to fairy tales. And endless, what? Genealogies. Do you know that they have a five-story computer bank with endless genealogies in Salt Lake? Endless. If you want to find your family tree and you write into Washington for any statistics, they're going to send you back the little bit that they have, and then they're going to refer you to Salt Lake City. That's how powerful 
their banks of computers are. More than likely, you are on their list. More than likely in their computer bank. And the strange thing about it is, look what the Lord says. He said, Nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. In other words, don't worry who your great-grandma was. If you want to go all the way back, it was Adam and Eve, then you can forget it. Amen? And you got to press on to the things that lay ahead. You see? That's the exciting part. And where the Mormons get off on this is they start tracking. I had one woman say, well, I just, I, I just don't have time for all this other Bible reading. I'm so busy working on my genealogy. You see how that can captivate a person? They're so busy into that stuff. They don't have time to further Christ. And that's where Satan pulls them off. Now, I'd like to deal with one other thing. A lot of people say, look how beautiful the Mormon church is. Look how beautiful the Mormon tabernacle choir is. In fact, a lot of Christians buy those records at Christmas time. And they play them. You know, they show this big pipe organ on the front. And I don't know what they charge for the record. But if you've ever bought one, break it. You know, just destroy it. It's junk. Never pay a penny to a cult. Just never do it. And there's too many good to invest in. You know, give them your money. Uh, put put some money in their thing. You know, uh, help them out a little bit. And, and get some good Christian stuff. But I've seen people and they say, here's the Mormon church. And one lady said, oh, we have such beautiful musicians. We have such beautiful bishops. Our buildings are so pretty. I mean, we have such a clean organization. You see, what looks clean is exterior. The Scripture says clean the inside of the cup first. The Holy Spirit does that. Then the outside of the cup will become clean. All cults work on the outside first. Have you ever noticed? They always try to clean up the act on the outside. The inside is pathetic still. The Holy Spirit cleans the inside. And then kind of works out. 